Hey, uh, this was a significant week for me. Uh, I turned 40 on Wednesday. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I am old. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think I look old, uh, but I did shave off all my gray uh, whiskers just to make sure to remove the evidence. I don't uh, think that I feel all that old, although my metabolism has taken notice that I am 40 now. I'm going to do something about that. But if you talk to my teenage daughter, who's a freshman in high school, I am super old. I am super old and irrelevant, okay? I mean, other than my earning power and my ability to drive, I'm not sure what, I, what purpose I serve in her life. And at least that's the way she sees it. And even that is becoming less and less relevant because her friends are getting older and they are able to drive. So according to my daughter, I am very old. But in many ways, I'm still very young, and I have a ton to learn. And uh, as if you'll just kind of humor me for a second as I reflect a little bit, I was thinking this past week, you know, I'm kind of straddling the fence here as a, as a new 40-year-old. Uh, I'm sort of like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I really don't know very much, you know? Like, maybe my, maybe my daughter is right, because I, I really do have a lot to learn about parenting in this phase of our lives. And I do have a lot to learn about marriage in this stage of my life. And frankly, I have a lot to learn about walking with Jesus at this age. And I really need the wisdom and the experience of men and women who've been there and done that. Of folks who have paid the dumb tax, if you will. So I don't have to. And at the same time, I'm starting to see, this is why I'm straddling the fence here, like at the same time, I'm, I'm looking and I'm seeing these younger generations coming up behind me. And there are these young leaders now who perhaps are uh, you know, teenagers or 20-somethings, and, and they need someone to cheer them on. They need someone to come alongside and serve them and invite them into opportunities to grow and stretch their wings like some older leaders did when I was a young buck. And they invited me, gave me a seat at the big boy table. They patiently listened to my idealistic rants. They threw me into the fire to practice my gifts. And I wonder if you thought about it for a moment, if you could think of someone older and wiser who invested in you. Maybe they put up with you when you were just a little rascal. Or maybe they've patiently listened to you as you complained about your new husband or your new wife not replacing the toilet paper roll. Someone who shared lessons that they've learned. Who told you how God walked with them through this or through that. I hope we can all think of someone like that. Likewise, I I imagine that many of us have experienced the satisfaction and the joy that comes with sharing our stories, sharing our wisdom and our experience, however deep or long that might be, with someone else. After all, we were made to make a difference. It's hardwired into us by our Creator. And that's part of life together in the family of God. That's what we've been talking about over the past several years. Weeks, And in case you haven't been with us, I want to go back and review just a little bit since we started this conversation back in August when we talked about how our doctrine, which is a fancy word for what we believe about God, what we believe the Bible teaches, that, that doctrine creates a culture. What we believe creates how we live or informs how we live. And, and so we want to have a gospel doctrine that forms a gospel culture. We talked about this idea that the triune God who lives in perfect relationship is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We sang about that a few moments ago. He created us for relationship, for fellowship. We talked about that word. It's not just getting together and hanging out. It's so much deeper than that. It's this deep sharing of life. We've talked about how we believe in the grace of God how we don't deserve it and we cannot earn it, but we have received it or we are learning how to receive it. And we want to be a culture or create a culture that celebrates and revels in 
this incredibly amazing, scandalous grace of God. And we want to be people who extend that grace to one another. We believe that Jesus coming to earth and dying for us was the ultimate act of humble service. And he's taught us to create a culture of serving one another just like he has served us. We've talked about 1 John 1, 7 that tells us when we walk in the light, as he is in the light, because he is the light, we have fellowship, that sharing of life with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin. So we want to have a culture here of honesty. We said that walking in the light is having an honest relationship with God and with others so that we're free to grow. And this week, the big idea is simply this. We believe the gospel of God is passed along by the family of God. Life together means living out what we see in Psalm 145, verse 4. Jay read it just a few moments ago. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Now, I don't know about you, but when... When I hear that, perhaps when you hear that, you immediately think of children. You know, you think about the importance of telling the next generation, the youngest generation, about Jesus. And that is absolutely correct. But I wonder if it's just a little bit incomplete. I want us to get a picture this morning of multiple generations sitting around together telling stories about the greatness of God. This morning I want to talk about the importance of telling the children about who our God is. But I want to also talk to the older generation and then also to us in-betweeners. So let's start by talking about how absolutely essential it is that the family of God tell the youngest generations about the gospel of God. If you've got a Bible and you want to open it up to the book of Deuteronomy, we'll be there for just a moment. Deuteronomy is in the Old Testament. If you want to fire that up on your smartphone, do that. We'll have it on the screen if you need it. In Deuteronomy, Moses has gathered the people of God so that he can give them some final instructions because they're about to enter the promised land. If you remember, at this point in the Bible, God's people have been rescued out of slavery. They were slaves for over 400 years in Egypt. They, they cried out to God, Finally, God decided it was time to act. And through a series of incredible acts, he leads them out from slavery and then into the wilderness where he gives them his covenant, the law, the instructions for how to live in relationship with him. And they have some some struggles and some crazy things that happen along the way for about 40 years. And now they're about to enter the land. But Moses is not going to go with them. So he's giving them final instructions. And he says in Deuteronomy 6 and a perhaps very familiar passage. He says, Hear, O Israel, listen up. The Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words, these words that I command you, shall be on your hearts. Then you shall teach them diligently to your children. Now, why would Moses include this in his final instructions? Well, in the next few verses, he's going to explain that your God is about to bring you into this incredible land. And it's full of cities you didn't have to build. It's got wells there that you didn't have to dig. Vineyards that you didn't have to plant and wait for the fruit to be produced. He's giving all of that to you. And then Moses says in verse 12, but take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. You shall not go after the gods of the peoples around you. Don't forget God. When you move into this incredible place that he's giving you, don't forget who has given it to you. And then I love this wisdom from Moses. Moms and dads, pay special attention right here because he says that after you've done all these things, after you've put God's commands on your own hearts, and after you've talked about these things over and over and over to your children at at 
bath time and bedtime and dinner time and driving around in the van time, there's going to be a day, verse 20, there's going to be a day when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that our Lord, our God has commanded? What's up with all these rules, mom? And then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Moses says, you're going to move into this new city. You're going to see all these other people around you. They are different than you. They believe different things than you do. They've got different rules and ideas about morality. And your kids are eventually going to watch those other kids. And they're going to go, why? Why, mom? Why can't I go to that party at that house? Why can't I go to school looking like that? Why can't we watch that movie? Or, or why, what's going on this weekend? What's up with this festival that God has commanded us to remember? I wanted to go to my friend's house this weekend. What is going on with all these rules and festivals and ceremonies? And then you'll say, listen, son, I know these things may, may make you feel like a slave, but you have no idea. Let me tell you what it was like to be a slave. Let me tell you how God delivered us and our people from slavery. Let me tell you the story. You want to know what we're celebrating this weekend and why we can't go do that thing that your friends are doing? Let me tell you about the night that God passed over us before death came in and brought death to all the firstborn in Egypt. Let me tell you about how God made manna come out of the sky. Let me tell you about how water came out of rocks. Let me tell you this story about our great God. One generation shall praise your works to another and declare your mighty acts. I love how the psalmist there does not say one generation shall file all the the younger generation, into a classroom where they will get out the flannel graph and they will begin to tell the stories about the Old Testament. No! One generation will praise his works to another. They will tell those stories with worship and exaltation because it's exciting and following Jesus is an adventure because the King of Kings is our King. He's always in control. He's always good. And his light always outshines the darkness. Let me tell you about him. It should result in awe and wonder. Stir something in us. But I wonder, is that how you learned about the Bible? Is that how you learned about God? This is a good challenge and reminder for us is if we're teaching our kids about a boring school librarian of a God or a graceless probation officer who's always looking over their shoulder like an angry elf on a shelf, we are not telling them about the one true God. That is not who our God is. Now, parents, this is our job. Parents, we're, it's our primary responsibility to tell them, our kids, about our great and incredible God. But we're not alone in this. You are not alone in this. Regardless of your stage of parenting, I can promise you this. A time is going to come when you and your children are going to need other adults in their lives. They need it. You need it. And I am so thankful for the teachers who've been pouring their lives in to my daughter's lives. I was just reflecting this past week how my oldest daughter's been taken out over the past several months by three different older women from this church family. Each of them are in different stages of life and they've been pursuing her. And honestly, there are things that she's probably telling them that she's not telling me. I mean, I sort of grieve that as a dad, but I realize that that's the reality it was the same when I was a teenager. And I'm so glad that they have someone else to tell. 
Someone I know loves Jesus and loves them. And you know what? Research is backing this up. There was a Lifeway research study done in 2010 that said teenagers who had at least one adult from church make a significant time investment in their lives. Listen to this. They were more likely to keep attending church as they grew up. 46% of those who stayed in church said five or more adults at church had invested time with them personally and spiritually. I read that right out of a book called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. I highly recommend this book. In fact, I've got a, a copy of it for the first person who comes and asks me about it after the service. Parents, if you've got um, children in elementary school especially, like you need to read this. This was so encouraging to me. I believe it'll be encouraging to you as well. We've got folks that are loving on those kids back there in that orange hallway. We've got, we've got an incredible team of volunteers who are loving our, our middle school and high school students. They're pouring out their lives uh, for your kids and my kids. And one of my favorite examples of what's going on here in all of this is these guys right here. Uh, you might remember us sharing their story. I took a screenshot of their video, which you can find on our website. If you go to at 2rc.org and you look for the stories section, you'll find their story. Um, they, this is Ty Cooper and Oliver Jessen. And uh, Oliver is now a fifth grader. And, uh, and they met one another setting up kids' classrooms at, you know, 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings. And Oliver had been setting up for a while and kind of knew the ropes, so so he, he was kind of the boss, and, w and, they, and he began to train Ty in how to set up all those classrooms. And they began to form a relationship. They, they created this incredible team, and now Ty picks Oliver up once a month and takes him to dinner. And they just talk about stuff, you know, whatever, whatever Oliver wants to talk about. I don't think you can underestimate how much this stuff means to me as a dad when someone invests in my kid. How much it means to me as a pastor. How important this is. And I'll show you why. There's a really dark picture of what happens to a people when a generation does not have this kind of investment. It's in the book of Judges in the Old Testament. Joshua, after Moses died, you know, Joshua led the people into the promised land. And uh, they sort of, they conquered, they took over, they set up their own homes. And each of them had an inherited piece of that land for all the different tribes of Israel. And, and the people are following God. They see God do all kinds of incredible things. And then we read that, that Joshua dies. And that great generation that served alongside Joshua, the elders and the leaders, they all pass away. And then the end of Judges 2 verse 10 says this, And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for Israel. And you read that and you're like, how did that happen? Why did that happen? And it doesn't explain it to us, but we can think about it. Did they just get busy? They have a lot going on, and they moved into this, this new home, new territory. They're not slaves anymore. They, they did li they, they're not living in those cities they didn't build, and the vineyards were already there. They didn't have to plant them, you know. And, and, and perhaps they just got busy. Maybe they talked about God less. Maybe the older generation just wasn't as invested anymore. They felt like they had run their race. They had paid their dues. Maybe they took for granted that these kids would grow up and understand their identity. Maybe they took for granted that these kids would, would just understand God's plan for sexuality or morality or that they would just pick up on God's bigger, more satisfying purpose for their lives. But they didn't, not without that intentionality. Let's not let that happen. Not in our church family, not in our community. One generation shall praise your works to another.
This isn't just about teaching children about Jesus. Because we grow up and we still need help, right? You still need help, right? Okay, good. I'm not alone in this. I still need help. And we find ourselves as young husbands and wives and moms and dads wondering how in the world are we supposed to do this? If only we had some older folks, a generation of people who've been there and walked through that. The Apostle Paul actually addresses this very thing in his letter to Titus. If you want to flip back now in your Bibles to the New Testament letter of Titus. It's just past the letters to Timothy. Paul left Titus on the Greek island of Crete. And I actually have a map to show you uh, where this is. There is a box around the Greek island of Crete, just to the south of Greece, to the north of kind of northern Africa, Libya, there, uh, Libya and Egypt there to the south. Um, that's the island of Crete. And if you're going to be left somewhere, you know, like just look at those horrible conditions that Titus was left in. I wanted you to see a picture of that incredible uh, water from the Mediterranean Sea there. I mean, like that's, that's the life, right? But Paul left Titus there, he says in chapter 1, verse 5, to put what remained in order and to appoint elders in every town. They, they traveled there on their travels and at some point started teaching the gospel, started gathering folks together, coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Communities are being set up as new believers to do life together. But, but Crete was historically and, and you know, it, it was known as a rough place. Because you have to remember that at one time they were totally unfamiliar with the gospel, living under the pantheon of Greek gods, all the cult-like superstitions, living the island life. One Cretan prophet actually called the Cretan people liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. It's there in Titus 1.12. And then Paul confirmed it. Yeah, they're kind of like that. There were false teachers there that had already sprung up in these churches, and there was a disconnect between the doctrine and their lives what they believed to be true, and how they were living. And so Paul writes to Titus in chapter 2, verse 1. He says, but as for you, Titus, you're, you're going to be different. He says, as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in love, in faith, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or gossips, as your Bible might say, slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good, literally to teach the beautiful news. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So Titus is there to teach the Cretans how to follow Jesus with their lives and Paul tells him to go straight to the older men and women. Why? Because the younger men and women would be looking to them for an example. Because young husbands would be wondering what a godly husband even looks like. Young moms would be wondering if they're enough. If they would be able to do all that was demanded of them. Paul wants these older men to have what he calls a healthy doctrine or a sound doctrine, a healthy faith. The Greek word there for sound, it, it kind of looks like the word for hygiene. It, it literally means healthy. Like, and when you have good hygiene, that's not only good for you, that's good for others as well, right? You wash your hands. That's good for other people. Have a, have a sound, healthy doctrine that's good for you. It's good for everyone around you. He wants the older women to pour their lives into the younger women, to train them how to love their husbands, how to be a mom, how to stay sane with all the demands of managing a household. And in case you get tripped up, ladies, by that word, working at home, when I read those verses, Paul's not saying you can't work outside the home. We can flip back to Proverbs 31 and see that woman, well, she was crushing it, so industrious, with, at home and with all the ways that in her, her business acumen, I mean, she was killing it. But my wife, she's working full time now, uh, and, and yet she knows the demands of 
managing a household. There's just things that I don't see and, and I, I have to be reminded to do all the time. She has a weight on her shoulders. And she needs someone who's a little farther down the road from her saying, hey, I remember those days. And it's hard. You're doing a good job. What Paul and Titus want to see in the churches on Crete is what we want to see here at Two Rivers, which is why I say to the older folks in the room, God's not done with you yet. Don't take the posture of, I've run my race, I've paid my dues. We still very much need you. You look around this church, it is not hard to find a parent who's drowning in diapers and Formula, and they got spit up stains all over their shoulders, and they're carrying around car seats. Preach, right, Kevin? Yes. Look around and see the single men and women who are trying to discover their worth and their purpose and wondering, what's God got for me? We need, yeah, okay. We need you, older generation. And here's the beautiful thing that I just want to say, and I love being able to say this. You're doing this. This is already happening. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine, who's a young dad, he started going to the men's group that meets on Wednesday mornings at 6.30 in the morning. And he actually lives pretty far away from the church office. But he would drive there every Wednesday to get there at 6.30 because he wanted to be around one of the leaders there who's one of our elders, Brian House. A man who's been married for decades who's raised three godly daughters, and my friend just, just wanted to catch everything that was dripping off that guy. Now, years later, that friend is a leader in that group alongside Brian. A few days ago, I bumped into Linda, getting our cars worked on. And uh, Linda and I started talking about um, her small group. And uh, I didn't tell her I was going to tell this story, but um, when you bump into me and I'm preaching that week, you're, you just might find your way into the sermon. So uh, we're, we're talking about her small group, and she was telling me how she was a little nervous about going to this women's group um, because she might just be the old one in the group. And uh, she was encouraged to find that that wasn't necessarily the case, and there was sort of a, a variety of ages and stages of life in that group. And as she walked off, I texted her leader and said, hey, I just bumped into Linda and just so encouraged about the group. Great job. And, uh, and the leader's response back to me was, oh, I love Linda. She is sharp. Let me translate that for you. Coming from a young leader and a young mom, I'm so thankful Linda is in our group because she has a lot of things that we need. And she's going to speak into these younger women. She has something to offer. And I heard about another younger woman in one of our other women's groups who knows a ton about the Bible already for her age. And as I learned more about her story, I learned that it's, it's because she grew up in a church that was older and had a lot of older people in that church. And, uh, and so the women's ministry that she tried to plug into uh, was full of older women and not a whole lot of women like her. But here's what, here's what they had, a lifetime of knowledge about God's word. A lifetime of experience following Jesus. And so this young 20-something gal is, is just full of, of understanding about who God is and about his word because of those older women that poured their lives into her. And I could just keep on going because I love bragging on our church. But here's the point. These stories are why it's so important for us younger folks, and I'm including myself in that as a 40-year-old, to get around the older folks. We need you. That's why this year we've shifted the way we're putting our small groups together and going forward. We're trying to put a mixture of people into a group. We're not, we just decided, you know, it might not be good to have all like young married couples in a group together being led by a slightly less young married couple. That's like the blind leading the blind, right? And we're like, you know what we need? We need, we, we need people from every stage of life so that one generation can praise the works of God to another. So a final word to the younger generation. This is from Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4.12, he writes, 
Don't let anyone, Timothy, and Timothy had a big job. He was a young guy with a big job in Ephesus. He said, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So what I say to the kids and the teenagers and the 20-somethings and the young leaders, perhaps even the in-betweeners like myself, what are you waiting for? Jump in. Let God work not only in you, but through you. You can have an impact on your world. And you don't have to wait until you get it all figured out. I love what Christy Primus, our kids ministry director, is doing. This was something that's been on her heart since the day we interviewed her. She said, I want to see kids ministering to other kids. And you know what? It's happening. Right now, second, third, fourth graders who have already been to class for one service are serving kids that are younger than they are. Now, what kind of 10-year-old or 11-year-old thinks he or she could be a leader or a mentor to kids when they're just a kid? Well, I'll tell you what kind. The one who's been told that he can. The one who's had someone older come along and say, you can do this. I believe in you. I see God in you. Come serve with me. So for the older folks in the room, Let's believe in and cheer on the younger generations that are behind us. Let's breathe life and confidence into them. Let's call them to something bigger than themselves. And let's give them a taste of what it is like to be used by God. And for those younger leaders that are coming up, jump in. Start now. God wants to use you. Don't think that you can't have an impact on someone who's older than you. When I was 24, I took a job as a middle school pastor. I was a youth pastor to 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. And guess what? I didn't know anything about being a pastor. I'd never been one before. I didn't know anything about working at a church. I'd never worked at one before. I knew very little about life at all. I was 24 years old. But here's what I did know. I knew how to be a crazy idiot in middle school. And I knew the struggles. I knew what it was like to doubt yourself. And wonder if anybody likes you. I knew what they were going through, so I went with that. And that's what I say to you. Go with what you got. You've got more to offer than you think. We say around here sometimes, God loves to use broken people. So what? Each and every one of us have something to contribute here. Let me read Psalm 145.4 one more time. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I got a couple of pictures that come into my mind when I think about this. Maybe you've heard or thought about it before, like passing a baton. Like one generation is passing a baton, handing it off to the next generation. And I think that can be a really cool picture because it is the younger generations that are going to carry on the legacy of faith. And they're going to tell the next generation about Jesus. And they're going to be the ones that are going to rise up and continue uh, to build the church with the power of the Holy Spirit. But, But what about those that hand the baton off? What do they do? Are you just out to pasture? Like you got nothing else to give? (laughs) No. We need you. So I like to look at it more like this. Like a family sitting around a table together. And one generation is talking to another generation. One generation is telling stories of how God has shown up in their lives. And another generation is listening to that and then saying, and here's how I saw God, or here's what God's doing in my life, or tell me more about that. And we're sitting around the table and we're sharing stories of our lives. and We're laughing together and we're, we're listening to one another and we're praising God and pointing out how good he is. I think about this picture because 
we've been trying to teach our daughters some table manners so that when they go like to your house, it doesn't look like they've been raised by wolves. Yeah, I think in our, uh, we've create, we've made a mistake here. We, in our effort to be, you know, like to, to, to try to not have chaos or fighting and really just to make sure they get the right amount of food and everything, we plate all their food on the counter and then we take it over to the table for them. And what we've learned uh, is that when they go to other people's houses or when they come to like a big family style meal, like you, you, you just kind of look and you see that like some people are going hungry while, you know, like they're like, no one has the salad, but my daughter has all the salad because she didn't know how to, you know, serve herself, nor did she know how to pass it. And it made me think, you know, how often I have to say, Nora, pass the salad, please. Nora, would you pass the gospel, please? Would you tell me about what you see in God this week at school? Let me tell you about what God did in my life in sixth grade. Let me tell you about how I saw God, how daddy saw God this week. I just see this picture of a family and all these different generations gathered around sharing life and sharing the gospel. So older generation. Will you please pass some of that wisdom and experience on to us? Younger generation, will you please pass me some of that fresh passion and energy and desire for making a difference? I'll close with these three questions for us. Number one, who needs what you have? Just like my daughter at the table has the ranch dressing in front of her and I need it. Who needs what you have that you could pass along? No, no matter how old you are, as you look around and you see someone going through something you've been through. Number two, who has what you need? Who has been through something that you're walking through right now and you need help? And here's the third thing. Who are you pursuing? Because I think it'd be really easy for us to just go, well, no one's doing that for me. No one's pursuing me. Who are you pursuing? Older, younger. Who are you pursuing? Who are you pouring into? Who are you going and inviting out to coffee so you can glean everything you can from them and their faith? We all have something to contribute. Let one generation praise the works of God, declare his mighty acts. Let me pray for us.